Hello everybody and welcome to Radiology Tutorials. I'm Dr. Michael Nell. Today I want to share with you an approach to a solitary pulmonary nodule. Now as a radiologist or a future radiologist, it's important to have a structured framework in your mind when approaching these nodules. Firstly, because this is such a common incidental finding and we need to be comfortable with saying we can sit, wait and watch this lesion or we need to say this is a lesion that needs tissue diagnosis or it's a lesion that needs further imaging. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is that a small but significant portion of these lesions will actually represent a non-benign lesion. And early detection will have significant impact on the patient's prognosis. So that it goes without saying that the first thing we need to do is actually identify the nodule. And in radiology, if you're not looking for it, it can be quite easy to miss it. Now, the image on the left here, if you cast your eyes, anyone could pick out this nodule. If we look at the right lower zone of this chest radiograph, there's a rounded calcified nodule um, that anyone could pick out. My grandmother could look at that image and see the nodule. But often the lesions are a lot more subtle, especially with ground glass or sub-solid nodules. And we really need to examine the hemothoraces, cast our eyes right through the hemothoraces to see whether there's a nodule or not. And here, in fact, in this uh, image, there's a nodule here, which is made even more difficult by this third anterior rib coming across, obscuring the nodule slightly. And this is a good point to remember is that we also need to look at our review areas on a chest radiograph. We need to look at areas like the lung apices where we've got really crowded ribs, the clavicle coming across, a really easy to miss nodule up here. Behind the heart with the heart casting a shadow, it's quite easy to miss a lesion there. As well as behind the diaphragms, we've got the lung parenchyma going right down behind the diaphragms. So we need to, look, uh, need to assess those uh, regions here behind the right hemi diaphragm and behind the stomach bubble on the left. Secondly, when noticing a pulmonary nodule, we need to find out where in the AP plane does that nodule lie. Now there may be a sign like silhouetting or there may be a hilo overlay sign, but often in the periphery of the lung like this, it's very difficult to know where that lesion lies and it's important to assess the lateral radiograph to see where that lesion lies. And here we can actually see that this is actually a breast mass and not a pulmonary nodule. Now, once we've identified the lesion, we need to uh, figure out whether this in fact represents a solitary pulmonary nodule. Now, it's important to know this definition quite well because when we're going to use a prognostic tool later down the line in this uh, lecture, we need to make sure that what we're seeing is actually a solitary pulmonary nodule because that prognostic tool is specifically designed for something that fits this definition. So it goes without saying that it's solitary, so it's going to be a single opacity, but the lesion needs to be rounded. It can't be a wedge-shaped lesion or an area of consolidation, because uh, then we're dealing with something else other than a nodule. This opacity needs to be less than three centimeters. Now we've drawn a fairly arbitrary line in the sand that anything below three centimeters we call a nodule, and anything above three centimeters we call a mass, and our approach to those are si slightly different. And then this nodule needs to be surrounded by aerated lung, or if it's abutting the, abutting the pleura, there needs to be some aerated lung on the other side of the nodule. And uh, there should be no other related abnormalities within the uh, lungs. There shouldn't be any atelectasis or um, uh, pneumonia or lymphadenopathy. And again, as I've said, it needs to be smaller than three centimeters because lesions bigger than this we call a pulmonary mass. Now, when we've identified a nodule, we want to try and start figuring out what could this nodule represent. And I don't want, the, the goal of this lecture is to not go through all the etiologies of lung masses and lung nodules. Um, but we do need to have kind of an idea of what, what these could be. So when we're looking at malignant causes, they can be coming from the lung itself, bronchogenic carcinomas, or as I like to say, pulmonogenic, so something from lung parenchyma. So that could be squamous cell, could be small or large cell. It could be a pulmonary uh, adenocarcinoma, or it could be a distant metastasis that's coming. Often there's multiple metastases, metastases, but sometimes it's just a solitary metastasis. It could represent a lymphoma. It could be a carcinoid tumor. So there's a whole long list of things that could be malignant lesions within the lung. And the benign list is even longer. The most common is a hematoma or an infectious granuloma. But we could also have um, rheumatoid nodules, could have lymph nodes, we could have arteriovenous malformation, nod nodules that are seen in, in Wegener's granulomatosis. The list is as long as my arm for benign lesions. And these lesions are something that you can look up. And often the diagnosis only happens after we've biopsied these, 
or if they're a lesion that has very specific characteristics, which we'll see further on in the talk. Perhaps more important than figuring out what the etiology is, is balancing up the risk of, is this a malignancy, number one, and how much uh, exposure am, am I willing to have my patient have in terms of radiation? And it's this balance that we play as radiologists. We obviously don't want to miss a malignancy, but we don't want to unnecessarily expose patients to radiation. So this means that what we're actually trying to figure out is what is the risk that this lesion that we're seeing is malignant? Because that's going to determine our, our course of action as we go further forward. And luckily, there's actually a bunch of characteristics of lesions that will uh, make us think this lesion is actually more likely to be benign or it's more likely to be malignant. And each one of these characteristics, if you think of having a pin with malignancy on the one side and benign lesion on the other, and each one of these will move the pin either towards malignancy or towards benign and give us a good idea of what this lesion may represent. So I'm going to go through each one of these six characteristics today and show you how we can use them to decipher whether this in fact represents a malignancy. So let's start with size. Now, size alone is not a great indicator of whether a lesion is benign or malignant. But that being said, lesions under one centimeter, the vast majority of those will actually represent a benign lesion. Uh, malignant lesions above one centimeter, so from one centimeter nodules up to uh, six centimeter masses, we actually find that the distribution is relatively even for malignant lesions. We find almost just as many two centimeter malignant lesions as we do five centimeter malignant lesions. So size is not a great indicator, but it can give us an idea of, especially when the uh, lesion is small, that this is maybe benign and we need to follow it up. The other issue with size is that very small lesions are often missed or are below the sensitivity of a chest radiograph, and really small lesions are uh, more difficult to biopsy. They, they're less sensitive in PET imaging. So the size does play a significant role in what our future investigations will be. Next is location. Now, benign lesions, they don't care where they fall in the lung. Benign lesions are evenly spread out through the upper, middle, and lower zones of the lungs. Um, sometimes we will say that uh, uh, lesions that uh, are close to the pleura or close to the fissural lines are more likely to be benign because they're more likely to represent lymph nodes. Uh, but benign lesions are generally evenly spread out through the lung fields. Malignancy, on the other hand, has a predominance for upper lobes. So your index of suspicion for a malignant lesion must be higher when you see a lesion in the upper lobes. Upper lobes. That's not to say that a lower lobe lesion is not a malignancy. It's just that the probabilities are higher when we see them in the upper lobe. The next and perhaps the most complex topic is calcification. Now, there are four classes of calcification that generally fall under benign lesions and then a couple of exceptions that fall under malignant lesions. Now, the majority of malignant lesions won't have calcification, but as we'll see here, it's not the case for every malignant lesion. But let's look at some of the benign patterns of calcification. Here we can see diffuse solid calcification. The whole nodule is calcified. That is a relatively uh, strong sign that this lesion may actually in, uh, represent a malignant lesion. The second type of calcification, actually here we can see two types of calcification that are generally considered benign uh, signs of calcification. The first is um, the central nidus of calcification within a lesion, as, and the second is these laminated sheets of calcification that you see within a lesion. Those are both suggesting that this lesion is likely benign. And the last, and this is uh, more specific to a specific uh, benign lesion, which is a hematoma, it's called popcorn calcification. Now you get these concave uh, sheets of uh, calcification that face the center of the lesion, uh, and it kind of looks like a, a popcorn that's, that's popped out. Um, and this is very specific for a hematoma, and when you see something like this, it's, it's almost pathognomonic, and we can be a little bit more rest assured that this doesn't represent malignancy. Now, uh, as I said, malignant lesions can have calcification. So here on the image on the left, we've got this amorphous calcification of a lesion here. Um, some other signs that this may be malignant is a suffusion posteriorly here, as well as you can see the lesion is infiltrating some of the surrounding structures. These are high index of suspicion that this is in fact a malignant lesion. Here we can see we're, well, we're dealing with a mass here. This is larger than three centimeters, but I couldn't find um, an image with uh, a nodule, but pretend this is a nodule. 
we can see the small uh, eccentric uh, calcification. Now often these small eccentric uh, pieces of calcification actually can occur in, in carcinoid tumors or other malignant tumors. Um, this, this may be uh, a benign lesion, but it's it can happen in malignant lesions as well. So we need to, we can't say that if there's calcification, this is definitely benign because malignant lesions can actually have some calcification within it. And lastly, again, I found another mass. You would think um, I would find nodules, but if you have a large infiltrating destructive mass, uh, they may have bony fragments falling into that mass, but this is pre-existing bone. Here is the, the, the transverse process or the vertebral body that's actually broken away and uh, as the uh, malignancy has uh, destroyed the bone around it and that may give the impression that there's pieces of calcium or calcification in the mass where, there, where in fact it's actually pre-existing bone. Then we can look at growth. Now growth of a lesion is actually quite complex. We assume, we make some assumptions when we look at malignant lesions. The first assumption we make is that malignant lesions grow exponentially. They start at one cell, two, four, eight. And with, with that assumption, a large portion of, ma of malignant lesions life is actually gonna be spent very small if we're starting from one cell. And only then do we get faster growth of a lesion. So often malignant lesions are around for a long time before we even detect them. The second thing when assessing a growth of a lesion is that we assume the lesion to be spherical, exactly spherical. And we know in real life that that's not the case. But when we're calculating the volume of lesion, when we're calculating the doubling time of a lesion, we assume that lesion to be spherical. So what research has shown is that anything below 20 days doubling time, so when we're looking at the doubling time of a lesion, if it's below 20 days, it's more likely to represent something that's benign. It's more likely to represent an infectious cause of the nodule. Same goes with lesions that double uh, in volume over 400 days. That slow process doesn't fit with that exponential growth that we associate with malignancies, and we can fairly confidently say that those are benign lesions further on. This central part, this is where we are unsure. This is where this could represent malignant or benign lesions, but we need to have a high index of suspicion for those malignant lesions. Now, just a point to note that when we are, uh, say we have a nodule like this in the lung, when we're measure, measuring the radius or, whether, or the diameter of the lesion, we're not measuring the doubling time as doubling of that radius. That, that lesion is gonna be far greater than double the volume. So when we look at the volume of a sphere, it's four over three pi r cubed. And uh, I'm not gonna do the maths, but when the r value, when the radius or the diameter, doesn't really matter here, increases by 25%, that in fact will represent double the volume. So if we're looking at this lesion, if this lesion then became out to here, that new lesion now would be double the volume, assuming that that lesion is in fact a perfect sphere, which it never is the case. So the growth of a lesion can provide us some great clues as to whether this is malignant or whether it's benign. Then we can look at the actual morphology of the lesion. We can look at the internal and external characteristics of the lesion. Now here we have another hamartoma, and another clue that something is a hamartoma is if there's portions within that mass that have fat density. That's very suggestive of a hematoma. If you've got a lesion that's irregular, it's got thick walls, it's cavitating, we have a higher suspicion for malignancy. If it's got thin walled, it's well-rounded, we may be thinking this is more benign. There is a characteristic that's quite specific for cancer, and actually I've got a crab here because we, we call it speculation with the lesion infiltrating into the surrounding parenchyma. And that's actually where cancer gets its name from. If you think about the star sign, cancer, it's a crab. The Latin origin of the word cancer is actually crab with the, the legs of the crab representing the speculation that infiltrating. If you see a mass like this, you really need to think this is a malignant and you are going to need a tissue biopsy of this mass or you are going to need resection of this mass. The last thing we're going to look at is enhancement of a lesion. Now, whether a lesion on CT enhances post-contrast. And we again draw a line in the sand here of 15 Hounsfield units. So we can be relatively confident in a mass, uh, or a nodule, I should say, a nodule doesn't enhance by more than 15 Hounsfield units after the administration of contrast. The positive predictive value of that being a benign lesion is actually quite high. Afterwards, 
we the the picture is not as clear. Most uh, a, a large portion of those will represent a malignant lesion, uh, and it's a very sensitive uh, test, but it's not very specific. And we our positive predictive value of whether this is malignant is actually quite low because there are some benign lesions that will enhance. So now we've gone over these six characteristics, we will have a fairly good idea of whether this nodule is in fact malignant or whether it's benign. But what weighting do we give to those factors? You know, does enhancement count more than uh, the morphology or does the size count more than the location? And luckily, there's a tool that allows us to predict just how much uh, each of these would uh, count towards whether this is malignant or benign, as well as taking into other uh, factors that aren't uh, related to the imaging, like the sex of the patient or the age of the patient. And that's known as the Brock model. Now, a link below, I'm going to have this up-to-date calculator um, as well as the original article that this is based on. And it's a very simple tool where you can put the age of the patient, the sex, or there's a slight female predominance, whether they have emphysema or a smoking history, the size of the nodule, the morphology if it's a solid nodule or um, a ground glass opacity or a, a sub-solid nodule, or uh, where this nodule um, is located, is it in the upper lobe, as we mentioned before, or whether this nodule has speculation or not, or whether there are multiple nodules or not. And this tool is great for us as radiologists because it's going to give us a probability score here, a probability that this will be diagnosed with cancer within the next two to four years. And this is a nice quantitative figure that we can then go to our clinician, we can go to the patients and really get an idea of whether this lesion is malignant or benign. So I will have those all linked below. I, this is my first, uh, first YouTube video, so it's maybe a bit all over the place. I am going to get better with this with time. But if you've got to this portion of the lecture, I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope it's helped you in some way. I would really appreciate it if you liked this video or you shared it with friends or you saved it to a playlist for you to watch later when you actually come across a pulmonary nodule in your practice. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next lecture. I hope you have enjoyed this. Goodbye, everybody.